The Battle of Lake Erie, sometimes called the Battle of Putin Bay, was fought on 10 September 1813, in Lake Erie off the coast of Ohio during the War of 1812. Nine vessels of the United States Navy defeated and captured six vessels of British Royal Navy. This ensured American control of the lake for the rest of the war, which in turn allowed the Americans to recover Detroit and win the Battle of the Thames to break the Indian Confederation of Tecumseh. It was one of the biggest naval battles of the War of 1812. Background 1812 When the war broke out, the British immediately seized control of Lake Erie. They already had a small force of warships there the sloop of war Queen Charlotte and the brig General Hunter. The schooner Lady Prevost was under construction and was put into service a few weeks after the outbreak of war. These vessels were controlled by the Provincial Marine, which was a military transport service and not a naval service. Nevertheless, the Americans lacked any counter to the British armed vessels. The only American warship on Lake Erie, the Brig Us Adams, was not ready for service at the start of the war, and when the American Army of Brigadier General William Hull abandoned its invasion of Canada, Adams was pinned down in Detroit by the British batteries at Sandwich on the Canadian side of the Detroit River. The British Major General Isaac Brock used his control of the lake to defeat Hull's army at the Siege of Detroit by cutting the American supply lines and rapidly transferring himself and some reinforcements to Amherstburg from where they launched a successful landing on the American side of the Detroit River. The British took Adams when Detroit was surrendered, renaming her Detroit, together with the Brig Caledonia, which had been commandeered from the Canadian Northwest Company. She was boarded and captured near Fort Erie on 9 October by American sailors and soldiers led by Lieutenant Jesse Elliott. Detroit ran aground on an island in the middle of the Niagara River and was set on fire to prevent her being recaptured. Caledonia was taken to the Navy Yard at Black Rock and commissioned into the United States Navy. Also present at Black Rock were the schooner Summers and Ohio and the sloop rig trip, which had all been purchased by the United States Navy and were being converted into gunboats, while the British held Fort Erie and the nearby batteries which dominated the Niagara River. All these vessels were pinned down and unable to leave Black Rock. Late in 1812, Paul Hamilton, the United States Secretary of the Navy had received longtime American Lake Mariner Daniel Dobbins, who had escaped capture at Detroit and brought information on the British forces on Lake Erie. Dobbins recommended the Bay of Presque Isle in Erie, Pennsylvania as a naval base on the lake. Dobbins was dispatched to build four gunboats there, although Lieutenant Tellius objected to the lack of facilities. Commodore Isaac Chauncey had been appointed to command of the United States Naval Forces on the Great Lakes in September 1812. He made one brief visit to Erie on 1 January 1813 where he approved Dobbins's actions and recommended collecting materials for a larger vessel, but then returned to Lake Ontario where he afterwards concentrated his energies. 1813 In January 1813, William Jones ordered the construction of two brig-rigged corvettes at Presque Isle, and transferred shipwright Noah Brown there from Sackett's Harbour on Lake Ontario to take charge of construction. Other than their rig and crude construction, the two brigs were close copies of the contemporary US Hornet. The heaviest armament for the ships came from foundries on Chesapeake Bay, and were moved to Presque Isle only with great difficulty. However, the Americans could get other materials and fittings from Pittsburgh, which was expanding as a manufacturing center, and smaller guns were borrowed from the Army. Master Commandant Oliver Hazard Perry had earlier been appointed to command on Lake Erie, through lobbying by Jeremiah B. Howell, the senior senator from Rhode Island, supplanting Lieutenant Elliott. He arrived at Presque Isle to take command at the end of March. Having arranged for the defense of Presque Isle, he proceeded to Lake Ontario to obtain reinforcements of seamen from Commodore Isaac Chauncey. 
After commanding the American schooners and gunboats at the Battle of Fort George, he then went to Black Rock where the American vessels had been released when the British abandoned Fort Erie at the end of May. Perry had them towed by draft oxen up the Niagara, an operation which took six days, and sailed with them along the shore to Presque Isle. Meanwhile, Commander Robert Herriot Berkeley was appointed to command the British squadron on Lake Erie. Another British officer had already endangered his career by refusing the appointment as success appeared unlikely. Barclay missed a rendezvous with Queen Charlemagne at Point Abino and was forced to make the tedious journey to Amherstburg overland. Arriving on 10 June, he brought with him only a handful of officers and seamen. When he took command of his squadron, the crews of his vessels numbered only seven British seamen, 108 officers and men of the Provincial Marine, 54 men of the Royal Newfoundland Fencibles and 106 soldiers, effectively landsmen, from the 41st foot. Nevertheless, he immediately set out in Queen Charlotte and Lady Prevost. He first reconnoitred Perry's base at Presque Isle and determined that it was defended by 2,000 Pennsylvania militia, with batteries and redoubts. He then cruised the eastern end of Lake Erie, hoping to intercept the American vessels from Black Rock. The weather was hazy, and he missed them. During July and August, Barclay received two small vessels, the schooner Chippeway and the sloop Little Belt which had been reconstructed at Chatham on the Thames River and attempted to complete the ship-rigged corvette HMS Detroit at Amherstburg. Because the Americans controlled Lake Ontario and occupied the Niagara Peninsula in early 1813, supplies for Berkeley had to be carried overland from York. The American victory earlier in the year at the Battle of York resulted in the guns intended for Detroit falling into American hands. Detroit had to be completed with a miscellany of guns from the fortifications of Amherstburg. Barclay claimed at his court-martial that these guns lacked flintlock firing mechanisms and matches, and that they could be fired only by snapping flintlock pistols over powder piled in the vent holes. Barclay repeatedly requested men and supplies from Commodore James Lucas Yeo, commanding on Lake Ontario, but received very little. The commander of the British troops on the Detroit frontier, Major General Henry Proctor, was similarly starved of soldiers and munitions by his superiors. He declined to make an attack on Presque Isle unless he was reinforced, and instead he incurred heavy losses in an unsuccessful attack on Fort Stevenson, which he mounted at the urgings of some of his Indian warriors. Blockades of Presque Isle in Amherstburg by mid-July, the American squadron was almost complete, although not yet fully manned. The British squadron maintained a blockade of Presque Isle for 10 days from 20 July to 29 July. The harbour had a sandbar across its mouth with only five feet of water over it, which prevented Berkeley sailing in to attack the American ships, but also prevented the Americans leaving in fighting order. Barclay had to lift the blockade on 29 July because of shortage of supplies and bad weather. It has also been suggested that Berkeley left to attend a banquet in his honor, or that he wished the Americans to cross the bar and hoped to find them in disarray when he returned. Perry immediately began to move his vessels across the sandbar. This was an exhausting task. The guns had to be removed from all the boats, and the largest of them had to be raised between camels. When Barclay returned four days later, he found that Perry had nearly completed the task. Perry's two largest brigs were not ready for action, but the gunboats and smaller brigs formed a line so confidently that Berkeley withdrew to await the completion of Detroit. Chauncey had dispatched 130 extra sailors under Lieutenant Jesse Elliott to Presque Isle. Although Perry described some of them as wretched, at least 50 of them were experienced sailors drafted from us Constitution, then undergoing a refit in Boston. Perry also had a few volunteers from the Pennsylvania militia. His vessels first proceeded to Sandusky where they received further contingents of volunteers from Major General William Henry Harrison's Army of the Northwest. 
After twice appearing off Amherstburg, Perry established an anchorage at Putin Bay, Ohio. For the next five weeks, Barclay was effectively blockaded and unable to move supplies to Amherstburg. His sailors, Proctor's troops, and the very large numbers of Indian warriors and their families there quickly ran out of supplies. After receiving a last-minute reinforcement of two naval officers, three warrant officers and 36 sailors transferred from a transport temporarily laid up in Quebec under Lieutenant George Bignall, Barclay had no choice but to put out again and seek battle with Perry. In the days preceding the battle, Perry told his friend, Purser Samuel Hambleton, that he wanted a signal flag, or battle flag, to signal to his fleet when to engage the enemy. Hambleton suggested using the dying words of Perry's friend Captain James Lawrence of the frigate Us Chesapeake, don't give up the ship. Hambleton had the flag sewn by women of Erie, and presented it to Perry the day before the battle. The flag would become an icon in American naval history. Battle. On the morning of 10 September, the Americans saw Barclay's vessels heading for them, and got underway from their anchorage at Putin Bay. The wind was light. Barclay initially held the weather gauge, but the wind shifted and allowed Perry to close an attack. Both squadrons were in line of battle, with their heaviest vessels near the center of the line. Perry hoped to get his two largest brigs, his flagship Lawrence and Niagara, into coronade range quickly. But in the light wind his vessels were making very little speed and Lawrence was battered by the assortment of long guns mounted in Detroit for at least 20 minutes before being able to reply effectively. When Lawrence was finally within coronade range at 12.45, her fire was not as effective as Perry hoped. Her gun is apparently having overloaded the carronades with shot. Astern of Lawrence, Niagara, under Elliot, was slow to come into action and remained far out of effective carronade range. It is possible that Elliot was under orders to engage his opposite number, Queen Charlotte, and that Niagara was obstructed by Caledonia. But Elliot's actions would become a matter of dispute between him and Perry for many years. Aboard Queen Charlotte, the British ship opposed to Niagara, the commander and first lieutenant were both killed. The next most senior officer, Lieutenant Irvin of the Provincial Marine, found that both Niagara and the American gunboats were far out of range, and passed the brig General Hunter to engage Lawrence at close range. Although the American gunboats at the rear of the American line of battle steadily pounded the British ships in the center of the action with raking shots from their long guns from a distance, Lawrence was reduced by the two British ships to a wreck. Four-fifths of Lawrence's crew were killed or wounded. Both of the fleet's surgeons were sick with lake fever, so the wounded were taken care of by the assistant, Usher Parsons. When the last gun on Lawrence became unusable, Perry decided to transfer his flag. He was rowed a half-mile through heavy gunfire to Niagara while Lawrence was surrendered. When Lawrence surrendered, firing died away briefly. Barclay was severely wounded and his first lieutenant was killed, leaving Lieutenant Inglis in command. Most of the smaller British vessels were also disabled and drifting to leeward. The British nevertheless expected Niagara to lead the American schooners away in retreat. Instead, once aboard Niagara, Perry dispatched Elliot to bring the schooners into closer action, while he steered Niagara at Berkeley's damaged ships. Helped by the strengthening wind, Niagara broke through the British line ahead of Detroit and Queen Charlotte and laughed up to fire raking broadsides from ahead of them, while Caledonia and the American gunboats fired from astern. Although the crews of Detroit and Queen Charlotte managed to untangle the two ships they could no longer offer any effective resistance. Both ships surrendered at about 3 p.m. The smaller British vessels tried to flee but were overtaken and also surrendered. Although Perry won the battle on Niagara, he received the British surrender on the deck of the recaptured Lawrence to allow the British to see the terrible price his men had paid. Casualties The British lost 41 killed and 94 wounded. 
the surviving crews, including the wounded, numbered 306. Captain Barclay, who had previously lost his left arm in 1809, lost a leg and part of his thigh in the action while his remaining arm was rendered permanently motionless. The Americans lost 27 killed and 96 wounded, of whom two later died. Of the vessels involved, the three most battered were converted into hospital ships. A gale swept the lake on 13 September and dismasted Detroit and Queen Charlotte, further shattering the already battered ships. Once the wounded had been ferried to Erie, Lawrence was restored to service for 1814, but the two British ships were effectively reduced to hulks. Aftermath Perry's vessels and prizes were anchored and hasty repairs were underway near West Sister Island when Perry composed his now famous message to Harrison. Scrawled in pencil on the back of an old envelope, Perry wrote. Perry next sent the following message to the Secretary of the Navy, William Jones. Once his usable vessels and prizes were patched up, Perry ferried 2,500 American soldiers to Amherstburg which was captured without opposition on 27 September. Meanwhile, 1,000 mounted troops led by Richard Mentor Johnson moved by land to Detroit, which also was recaptured without fighting on or about the same day. The British Army under Proctor had made preparations to abandon its positions even before Proctor knew the result of the battle. In spite of exhortations from Tecumseh, who led the Confederation of Native Tribes allied to Britain, Proctor had already abandoned Amherstburg and Detroit and began to retreat up the Thames River on 27 September. Lacking supplies, Tecumseh's natives had no option but to accompany him. Harrison caught up with Proctor's retreating force and defeated him on 5 October at the Battle of the Thames, where Tecumseh was killed, as was his second-in-command and most experienced warrior, Wyandotte Chief Roundhead. The victory on Lake Erie had disproportionate strategic import. The Americans controlled Lake Erie for the remainder of the war. This accounted for much of the American successes on the Niagara Peninsula in 1814 and also removed the threat of a British attack on Ohio, Pennsylvania, or western New York. However, an expedition in 1814 to recover Mackinac Island on Lake Huron failed, and the Americans lost eight of their smaller vessels and prizes. After the war, there was a bitter quarrel between Perry and Elliot over their respective parts in the action, mostly fought at second hand in the press. On the British side, Barclay was exonerated of any blame by a court-martial but was too badly injured to see service again for several years reconstructions and memorials. In 1820 Lawrence and Niagara were intentionally sunk near Misery Bay in Lake Erie, as they had went to rot. In 1875, Lawrence was raised and moved to Philadelphia, where she was displayed at the 1876 Centennial Exposition. Later that year, the ship burned when the pavilion that housed it caught fire. Although Niagara was raised and restored in 1913, she subsequently fell into disrepair. She was eventually disassembled, and portions of her were used in a reconstructed Niagara, which is now on view in Erie, Pennsylvania. The 352-foot High Perry Monument within Perry's Victory and International Peace Memorial now stands at Putin Bay, commemorating the men who fought in the battle. Another 101-foot High Perry Monument is located at the eastern end of Presque Isle in Erie, Pennsylvania. It stands next to Presque Isle Bay, where Niagara and Lawrence were built, stationed along with the rest of the American squadron and then scuttled after the war. Reasons for the American victory Most historians attribute the American victory to what Theodore Roosevelt described as superior heavy metal. Perry's leadership, particularly in the latter stages of the action, is also mentioned as a factor. The British historian C.S. Forrester commented, it was as fortunate for the Americans that the Lawrence still possessed a boat that would float as it was that Perry was not hit. On the British side, William Bell served as constructor and built Detroit, which was the best-built ship on the lake. 
However, Detroit was built slowly, in part due to Bell's perfectionism, and indeed it was the only purpose-built British warship constructed on Lake Erie during the war. The guns intended for Detroit were seized by the Americans at the time of their raid on Fort York the year before. This building imbalance, given the fact that six American ships were built in the same time frame, was another important cause of the American victory. The court-martial of Captain Barclay and his surviving officers determined that the captain, his officers and men had conducted themselves in the most gallant manner, and found that the defeat was the result of American superiority. An insufficient number of able seamen and the early fall of superior officers in the action, order of battle, listed in order of sailing.